to uh, three or four questions and uh, deal with them adequately. And sometimes the question <laughs> is large, uh, and it takes a, a good deal to answer it to uh, answer it thoroughly. So uh, tonight we want to deal with one question, and then uh, we have another major question and a couple others uh, for next month. So we have plenty of material. The question for tonight is, when and how is a Christian authorized by God to oppose his own government? For example, were the founders of our nation disobeying God when they rebelled against England? You don't have to admit it if you wrote this question. <laughs> but uh, it is uh, one that uh, uh, has a lot in the way uh, to answer it. So, normally, a Christian should obey the government, even an oppressive one, for all of the reasons that are cited in Romans chapter 13, 1 through 7. So let's read that particular text. Romans 13, beginning with verse 1. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For he is God's minister to you for good. For if you do evil, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore, you must be subject not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. Render therefore all uh, to all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to do, uh, customs, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Now, see you not only got uh, obedience to the civil government, you also for free get to pay taxes in this passage. And I know how people love to do that. But nevertheless, God has so ordained civil government, the concept of civil government. And uh, somebody might say, well, but, but doesn't Paul realize there are oppressive regimes and there are governments that don't love their people and uh, et cetera? Yeah, I think Paul living in the Roman Empire probably understood that. The Roman Empire eventually uh, persecuted Christians and put them to death. So uh, we need to realize that, yes, we have a responsibility to obey civil government. They were put in place by God. God authorized them, again, verse 1 of Romans 13. We also recall that in the Old Testament... God made known that he raised up nations. That is, he put them into power. When Habakkuk lamented the lack of justice in Israel, God answered him with uh, these words from Habakkuk uh, chapter 1, uh, verses 5 and 6. Remember now, the complaint was that... It, there was no justice in Israel. And here's what God said. Look among the nations and watch. Be utterly astounded. For I will work a work in your days which you would not believe, though it were told you. For indeed I am raising up the Chaldeans, a bitter and hasty nation which marches through the breadth of the earth to possess dwelling places that are not theirs. And he goes on to show 
that, the, uh, that this will be a nation that God raises up. God's going to appoint them to this to conquer Israel. Well, that's uh, not the only place. Likewise, God raised up the Medes later on to conquer Babylon because every nation that God raises up has a responsibility to do God's will. And uh, he may put them in power, but if they then do not recognize him, if they uh, do things that are evil as a result of the power they have, then God can destroy them too. And that's what we read in Jeremiah chapter 51, uh, verse 11. Make the arrows bright, gather the shields. The Lord has raised up the spirit of the kings of the Medes. For his plan is against Babylon to destroy it, because it is the vengeance of the Lord, the vengeance for his temple. So he raised up Babylon to destroy and take captive Jerusalem, but then he also raised up the Medes to conquer Babylon. So that is uh, the way God has operated as it concerns nations. And again, every nation that God raises up, they are responsible to God. If they abuse their power and they become unjust and corrupt like the nation they destroyed, God will destroy them also. And Babylon is a great example of that. Now, within the nation, however, citizens are to be law-abiding unless they are required to do something that is wrong, immoral, or sinful. And uh, we have a couple of examples, not really of uh, civil government, but of, of Jewish uh, government. And we find that in Acts chapter 4, verses 18 through 20. Acts chapter 4, verses 18 through 20. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered to them and said, Whether it is in the sight, uh, right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things that we have seen and heard. Now this happened again just uh, a little time later, and in Acts chapter 5 and verse 29, then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. And this has always been the case. If government requires you to do something you cannot do, you have to follow God. You have to disobey the civil government, because they have transgressed their authority. They don't have the right to uh, require you to do something that goes against God. Uh, this was, uh, as we mentioned, a conflict between Christians and Jewish rulers. Later on, Rome became the persecutor, and Christians chose death rather than than fighting against Rome, trying to gather a group of Christians together and go out and fight, or violating their conscience. They chose to be persecuted. They chose to be put to death. They refused to say Caesar is Lord and offer incense to Caesar as to God. They refused to do that, and so they were put to death. Now, we have a couple of other passages that talk about civil government. The most famous one is the one I suppose we read in Romans 13. But let's look at 1 Peter. <clears throat> 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. Therefore, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether as to king, as supreme, or to governors or those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. 
So again, we're required to uh, submit. And then let's also go to 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 16. Chapter 4, verses 12 through 16. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing had happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, when his, uh, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding uh, joy. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you. For the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part he is blasphemed, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or as a busybody in other people's matters. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in the matter. So those are some principles that have to do with the Christian and civil government. But now, what about the question of the United States and England? Well, it's a complicated issue. Many of those who first settled in America came here for religious freedom, which they did not enjoy in England. The King of England was pretty insistent that you be a member of the Church of England over which he was head. And even those who dared to translate the Bible into English were sometimes put to death. They didn't want the Bible in the language that everybody could read for himself. So many protested and came to America where they would not be forced to support something they, no, uh, they had no interest in supporting. And they could practice religion as they wished for the most part. The Revolutionary War came about for a number of reasons. Part of that was uh, considered the oppressive government in the form of taxation without Americans having any representation. Also soldiers who occupied houses and various other infringements of liberty. Ironically, those who were the spiritual leaders in the colonies were among the foremost to call for revolution. And they presumably knew the teachings of the Bible. But here is, the, here is where we have an interesting thing. And what is confusing in this question is that it's really talking about two different things. One involves the command to obey the government, but the example that is given involves national sovereignty. And these are two things. As citizens of the government, yes, we should pay taxes. Yes, uh, we should support the government. No, we should not disobey it unless we're just forced to. But that does not necessarily apply to nations with their own sovereignty. So let's take a look at a few examples. As early as Genesis 14, we read in the, the, the first couple of verses that there were four kings who went out to fight against five kings and defeated them. And they carried them off. They carried off the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah and Adma and Zeboim and Zoar, along with their people, which included Lot and his family. So what did Abraham say about this when he got word? Well, they're under a different regime now. I guess they'll just have to submit to them. No, that's not exactly the reaction he had. Instead, he got his uh, servants together, he got a fighting crew together, and went 
and fought against them and delivered them and released them. Because these are kings fighting each other. This involves uh, more uh, sovereignty than just an individual citizen within a kingdom. Now when it came to Egypt, God himself delivered Israel out of Egypt. And uh, if you want to know one of the reasons for that, Exodus chapter 1 and verse 14 will explain it. And they made their lives bitter with hard bondage in mortar and brick and in all manner of service in the field. All their service in which they made them serve was with rigor. They were being treated very badly. And they were their own people. They were a nation. They had been treated well during the lifetime of Joseph and afterward, but now... The Egyptians were taking away their sovereignty, taking away their rights, taking away their freedoms. And that uh, probably even included uh, worshiping God as they should have been able to do. So God himself delivered them out of the land of Egypt. The Old Testament is full of one nation battling another nation. Let's consider one of those that involves King Ahab. In the first chapter of, uh, or the 20th chapter of 1 Kings, we want to look at verses 1 through 8. Now Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, gathered all his forces together. There were with him 32 kings and horses and chariots, and he went up and besieged Samaria and made war against it. Then he sent messengers to the city to Ahab, king of Israel, and said, Thus says Ben-Hadad, Your silver and your gold are mine. Your loveliest wives and children are mine. And the king of Israel answered and said, my Lord, O King, just as you say, I and all that I have are yours. Then the messengers, by the way, this, you might call this the doctrine of appeasement. And when you practice the doctrine of appeasement, look at what happens. Then the messengers came back and said, Thus says Ben-Hadad, saying, Indeed, I have sent to you, saying, You shall deliver me your silver and your gold and your wives and your children. But I will send my servants to you tomorrow about this time, and they shall march, uh, search rather, your house and the houses of your servants, and it shall be that whatever is pleasant in your eyes, they shall put it in their hands and take it. Then the king of Israel called all the elders of the land and said, Notice, please, and see how this man seeks trouble. For he sent to me for my wives, my children, my silver, and my gold, and I did not deny him. And all the elders and all the people said to him, Do not listen or consent. And so naturally, a war ensued. But this was a war whether Israel would maintain its sovereignty or be captured by another nation. There comes a point in which things are so oppressive that they cannot be tolerated. But we are dealing with nations here, not citizens within a particular country. Consider what we studied just a few months ago when we talked about the uh, Maccabees. How that uh, Antiochus Epiphanes had offered up a, a sow on the altar in the temple, which was a disgraceful thing, a blasphemous thing. And the Jews thought themselves totally justified in rebelling because they were zealous for God. And they gained their independence for a time as a result of that. So, what about America? 
as a uh, nation existing on a separate continent, we had a right to seek our own sovereignty. Had we been English citizens living in England, Romans 13 would apply. But we had people from various countries who had come here for religious re uh, freedom among other reasons. And uh, so we tried peaceful solutions first. I want to read some uh, a quote, a rather lengthy quote, to just put the idea in perspective of what America was going through at this time. And uh, this is from Patrick Henry. And he explains why America needed to do what it did. He is answering some others in the assembly who had made an argument for not going to war. He calls them gentlemen. He addresses the person in charge of the meeting as sir. And uh, so this is what he said. I have one lamp by which my feet are guided, and that is the lamp of experience. I know of no way of judging the future, but by the past and judging by the past, I wish to know what there has been in the conduct of the British ministry in the last 10 years to justify those hopes which, which gentlemen have been pleased to solace themselves and the house. Is it that insidious smile with which our petition has been lately received? Trust it not, sir. It will not prove a snare to it will prove a snare to your feet. Suffer not yourselves to be betrayed with a kiss. Ask yourselves how this gracious reception of our petition comports with these warlike preparations which cover our waters and darken our land. Are fleets and armies necessary to a work of love and reconciliation? Have we shown ourselves so unwilling to be reconciled that force must be called in to win back our love? Let us not deceive ourselves, sir. These are the implements of war and subjugation, the last arguments to which kings resort. I ask, gentlemen, sir, what means this martial array if its purpose be not to force us to submission? Can gentlemen assign any other possible motive for it? Has Great Britain any enemy in this quarter of the world to call for all this accumulation of navies and armies? No, sir, she has none. They are meant for us. They can be meant for no other. They are sent over to bind and rivet upon us those chains which the British ministry have been so long forging. And what have we to oppose them? Shall we try argument? Sir, we have been trying that for the last 10 years. Have we anything new to offer upon the subject? Nothing. We have held the subject up in every light of which it is capable, but it has all been in vain. Shall we resort to entreaty and humble supplication? What terms shall we find that we have uh, not already uh, been exhausted. Let us not, I beseech you, sir, deceive ourselves. Sir, we have done everything that could be done to avert the storm which is now coming on. We have petitioned, we have remonstrated, we have supplicated, we have prostrated ourselves before the throne and have implored its interposition to arrest the tyrannical hands of the ministry and parliament. Our petitions have been slighted. Our remonstrances have been, uh, produced additional violence and insult. Our supplications have been disregarded. And we have been sterned, uh, spurned with contempt from the foot of the throne. In vain, after these things, may we indulge in the fond hope of peace and reconciliation 
There is no longer any room for hope. If we wish to be free, if we mean to preserve inviolate those inestimable privileges for which we have been so long contending, if we mean not basely to abandon the noble struggle in which we have been so long engaged, and which we have pledged ourselves never to abandon until the glorious object of our contest shall be obtained. We must fight. I repeat it, sir. We must fight. An appeal to arms and to the God of hosts is all that is left us. They tell us, sir, that we are weak, unable to cope with so formidable an adversary. But when shall we be stronger? Will it be next week? Or next year? Will it be when we are totally disarmed and when a British guard shall be stationed in every house? Shall we gather strength by irresolution and inaction? Shall we acquire the means of effectual resistance by lying supinely on our backs and hugging the delusion, a delusive phantom of hope until our enemies shall have bound us hand and foot? Sir, we are not weak if we make a proper use of those means which the God of nature hath placed in our power. Three millions of people armed in the holy cause of liberty and in such a country as that which we possess are invincible by any force which our enemy can send against us. Besides, sir, we shall not fight our battles alone. There is a just God who presides over the destinies of nations and who will raise up friends to fight our battles for us. The battle, sir, is not to the strong alone. It is to the vigilant, the active, the brave. Besides, sir, we have no election. If we were base enough to desire it, it is now too late to retire from the contest. There is no retreat but in submission and slavery. Our chains are forged. Their clanking may be heard on the plains of Boston. The war is inevitable and let it come. I repeat it, sir. Let it come. It is in vain, sir, to extenuate the matter. Gentlemen may cry, peace, peace, but there is no peace. The war is actually begun. The next gale that sweeps from the north will bring to our ears the clash of resounding arms. Our brethren are already in the field. Why stand we here idle? What is it that gentlemen wish? What would they have? If life, is life so dear or peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery? Forbid it. I know not coarse what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. This tells us the thinking of those who have decided to oppose England. And they are substantial reasons dealing with national sovereignty. They, I think, had a right to say this is our continent, this is our nation, and we are not going to be enslaved to you. This is not a matter of Romans 13, 1 through 7, or 1 Peter 2, or 1 Peter 4. This is a matter of who is going to rule this nation. If a nation cannot rise to power without God so willing it, then it was by God's grace that America was born. However, we ought not to be so much concerned about whether the origin of this nation is right or wrong. We should be more concerned about being punished for our sins. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. And we have many sins to account for. We must continue to spread the gospel and turn the hearts of the people back to God. 
Where is your heart this evening? We must stand for the truth of God as it pertains to morals, as it pertains to character, as it pertains to righteousness. If, as a Christian, you ought to repent of not being concerned about matters like these, then this is an opportunity for for repentance. There are many problems in this nation. And I firmly believe that if the church as a whole had been more evangelistic than what we have been, maybe some of these problems would not be as great as they are now. When people obey the gospel, they are saying, I am going to abide by the will of God. We're not just uh, here to amuse ourselves. We're not just here to congratulate ourselves on being saved. We are here to encourage one another in things that are right. But as a result of people obeying the gospel, there are going to be more moral lives. There are going to be more moral positions in public. And yet, all that we have seen in the last 50 years has been deterioration. We have gone away from the Bible. We have gone away from the Word of God. The nation has allowed abortion. The nation has allowed homosexuality. The nation has allowed homosexual marriages. The nation has allowed uh, drinking and gambling and about every vice that you can name. Where is the influence of Christians in fighting against these things and encouraging righteousness instead. It has even gotten to the point where people can tell one lie after another and many people don't even care. In fact, some of them stand back and say, boy, wasn't that done well? Well, the father of lies is Satan. If somebody can lie well, they must know Satan pretty well in order to get away with it. We need to have our hearts in the right place. If we are evangelistic and more and more people are converted to truth, not, not to denominationalism because many of them no longer stand for any morals whatsoever. In fact, some of them have been in the lead going away from morality. Only those who believe in truth are going to stand for the truth and communicate truth and convince people that they need to be saved by the blood of Jesus Christ and they need to live righteously. That might have an effect on our nation. So this evening, if you have never obeyed the gospel, please consider it. God has things for you to do. There are things that need to be done within the church. There are things that need to spill over and be done in society. But it starts with you giving yourself to God first and to Jesus, our Lord and Savior. If you're ready to confess him as the Son of God, if you've repented of your sins, if you are willing to be baptized, then we're ready to assist you this very evening. And if we can help you to grow spiritually as well as to become a child of God, please let us know while we stand and while we sing.